All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bruce Belzowski. I'm the Managing Director of the Automotive Futures Group uh, here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And this is our uh, speaker series, uh, Automotive Insights. For that, we're, This is our inaugural uh, speaker. Uh, we have with us today uh, um, David Andrea from Plant Moran. He's a principal there, and he's in charge of a supplier uh, survey that measures the different uh, aspects of supplier relations with manufacturers. Uh, welcome, Dave. Thank you, Bruce. It's great to be with you. Appreciate the invitation. We're gonna so we're gonna the, we're gonna set up the discussion today. We're gonna talk about kind of how we got to where we are today in terms of manufacturer supplier relations. It's something that. Uh, I was studying, and Dave as well. We all we started in the industry around the same time. Um, we started in the 1990s, get us up into into the early 2000s, into the recession and post recession, and to where we are today, and where we're going to be heading in the future. Uh, so when we look at what our relationship, the relations between manufacturers and suppliers, it's been something that's been going on since the industry started, but. Our research really started in the in the late 1980s, beginning in the 1990s, and this really had to do with the big three at the time for GM Chrysler uh, starting to make changes in how they were going to deal with their supply base. They started looking at how they could basically get many suppliers off their books very, very similarly to the way that the Japanese had been doing it for quite a while with their Koretsu system. And they would, so they spun off uh, many, many of their internal suppliers, uh, Ford into Visteon, GM into Delphi, uh, Chrysler into a uh, ACG. Uh, and so these suppliers now were in a environment where they had to compete with all the other suppliers in the world. And, uh, but they still had their contacts, their direct contacts with, with GM. And that lasted for quite a while. Uh, over time that changed and all the other suppliers became part of the, uh, of the become what, what became, uh, or we called them system integrator suppliers, where they were creating systems for, for the supply base, I mean, for their manufacturers. And these are the major, major, major uh, suppliers that we see today. Uh, uh, the Borg Warners of the world, the uh, uh, the Continentals, uh, the Denzos. They these are the large system suppliers that are are still around today and are very uh, strongly connected to to their manufact to manufacturers. Um, at the end of the 1990s, going into the 2000s, uh, during the dot com uh, bubble, uh, we really saw the introduction of the uh, of the IT that allowed manufacturers to start looking at uh, global pricing for their uh, for their via, for their components and and for their systems. Uh, so what we ended up having was auctions where suppliers would be competing against suppliers in Asia, Eastern Europe, and Mexico. Now, also during this time, we also had the introduction of globalization. NAFTA started in the early uh, in early 1990s. It really was going pretty strong, and in the uh, early 2000s, and you see the movement of suppliers to low cost uh, Mexico, uh, in Europe to Eastern Europe, uh, to in Asia to different parts of Asia uh, for the for the Japanese manufacturers. Uh, and in, that included China. And so we saw in the early 2000s, this issue having to do with uh, how, may, how suppliers were supposed to price their components to be able to win business. Now, Dave and I have been talking about this and one of the things that came out during this time having to do with this story about uh, landed cost, really trying to take in the account the cost of logistics, even though you are getting really low prices for your uh, for your components, Dave, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure, Bruce. Yeah, your, your chronology there is is, is accurate. Um, how the how the industry evolved over the last thirty years or so. I think what what you're really pointing out though is how 
purchasing was, was oriented towards commodity purchasing. It was oriented towards transactions, right? And, and from that standpoint, that got us to the peace price, peace tran uh, price transaction, um, and trying to get the lowest possible price. Now, of course, when you look at uh, all, all of the, the, the real hard costs I mean, in terms of supply chain and looking at logistics, looking at financial costs and uh, working capital in terms of inventory buffers that would be needed as, as you painted that picture of, a, of globalization there is maybe a little bit of an exaggeration, but those different costs were on different budgets. They were not on purchasing's budget. So the vehicle manufacturer never truly saw the landed cost or the true cost of a component, let alone the systems that you talked about that went into the final, the final vehicle. I, you know, look, I, I remember a, a presentation back at uh, when at the uh, uh, well, OSAD at that time, right? The Office for the Study of Automotive Transportation at the management briefing seminars. Um, and this would have been by George Perry, who George was the uh, uh, president of, of Yasaki, uh, the large uh, uh, wiring harness manufacturer. Uh, he was the president here for the Americas. And, and he, showed, he showed this map, I'll never forget it, that looked like, at that time, Northwest, Northwest Airlines uh, air, airline hubs, right? Because he had these hubs of production all around the world uh, to support the, the vehicle manufacturers. And he could, putting the pieces together in the Yazaki system, get the best landed cost. But that's the way he wanted to compete, not just on the base, uh, cherry picking the costs of, that might just come from a, 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 a low cost source in the Asia Pacific region. But you add up all those, and then on top of that, Bruce, you have to also add, and what we're seeing here day in and day out are the are the risks, right? The the uh, how do you ca uh, calculate uh, production shortages and those types of things um, as you as a, a as a customer weighs out does the trade off of a a lower cost but perhaps a longer supply chain. And, and that's what I think is, once again, it's, it's all getting re-evaluated. Re we, we've gone through these swings many times in the industry here, but I think, you know, just because particularly with chips and how um, much more content is going to be around electronics going forward, uh, the, the, the aspect of looking at landed costs, looking at the supply chain, uh, contingencies, uh, looking at uh, the uh, relationships, not at a transaction level, but at a relationship level uh, is, is, is going to be a foundation going forward uh, for, for purchasing. So I think that that really tells us a, a, a good lead into to what ended up happening in, in uh, going on right now. But also, we as we move along in our in our uh, timeline of manufacturer supplier relations, we start we get to the reset the the major recession that took place in 08 through 010, uh, and we're looking at uh, the industry uh, companies going bankrupt and suppliers going bankrupt, and even at during this time, there were always going to be certain kinds of shortages in the supply chain. Uh, Dave, how did we deal with those at, at, at that time? Well, we, you know, the, the industry is really good at dealing with crises, uh, with, 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 without a doubt. Um, but the, when we looked at um, supplier shortages or, or supply chain disruptions, I, I would characterize those as being more individual and more sequential. So by that, and you know, a good good example goes back to 
uh, there, there was a one, one plant in Europe uh, where uh, a, a key nylon uh, formulation came out of. Uh, they had a major fire. That plant was out of commission for many months. The industry uh, got a, a critical shortage immediately. Um, but that was, you know, I would tell you one, one huge crisis that the industry could uh, uh, convalesce around. Or we, you had the uh, volcanoes, right? You know, that would erupt in your, and you couldn't get air freight, you know, back and forth because of, of disruption in, in uh, air, uh, air lanes and things like that. This one though, just think of the layers of complexity that the industry has had to deal with. And by that, I mean, you know, you look at first and foremost, the, 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 the COVID pandemic at a global basis, right? Where plants had to be shut down uh, and reopened carefully. Uh, supply chains were, were disrupted because of, of um, labor shortages and, 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 and the like there. You look then on top of that, uh, we've had shortages with, um, uh, uh, again, in, in the petrochemical area with the uh, power uh, energy uh, crisis down in uh, uh, last winter in Texas and those refineries being shut down. You've had uh, rubber shortages and uh, carbon black shortages that the, 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 the ports in uh, uh, particularly Long Beach and, and LA that are all backed up, but, but also uh, hurricanes and others that that took out uh, 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 New Orleans and 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 Mobile and Shreveport uh, and the like there, those were all compressed and all on the industry's plate simultaneously. They could never really dig themselves out of it, and so that's where this issue about uh, relationships, I think, come into place so much um, more and, and, and are increasingly important because, you know, a transaction, anyone, I'm oversimplifying, but anyone can program a computer to send out uh, an electronic schedule, you know, have the, these parts shipped at this time, at this part uh, price, you know, so forth and so on. It's a transaction that can be programmed. Um, but it takes, it really takes a group of people, pros in a war room, right, that are simultaneously tracking all of these supply chains, trying to understand which, which shifts should be taken out, which one should be brought forward. Um, <clears throat> you know, even a decision like with GM taking out uh, super crews, you, you know, for uh, escalates for a period of time because you know all of these all of these it's it's a simultaneous equation that has to be dealt with uh, on a human scale it can't be programmed and it certainly can't be predicted i guess that's the biggest thing mm -hmm. uh, in terms of forecast yeah yeah and and that really leads us into kind of where we are today in terms of the development of relationships between manufacturers and suppliers. Now you've, you've uh, described in, in your analysis here, how that in, how important that those relationships are, if you really want to have a successful company uh, as a manufacturer. Uh, and, and you need to have a supply base that is going to respond to what you need when you need it. And uh, with in terms of pricing and product and, and R&D, whatever it, it might be. Uh, and uh, this is where uh, you, Dave, uh, has been working for a number of years on the, uh, the WRI. I'm going to let Dave talk a little bit about it. Uh, that looks at the, that measures um, as, as, as best as survey research can measure the uh, relationships between manufacturers uh, and their supply base. Thanks, Bruce. We, we um, at Plant Moran, uh, we, uh, we, we purchased the Working Relations Index uh, study or the WRI uh, from John Hankey and his Planning Perspectives Incorporated 
uh, uh, consultancy. And this goes back, uh, this, this index goes back um, well over 20, uh, uh, 20 plus years. This, this slide, just for simplicity, takes us back to 2012. Uh, but John, uh, doc, Dr. Hankey was a, a, a marketing professor at Oakland University, uh, actually worked with Tom Stallcamp, uh, who was the vice president of purchasing with uh, Chrysler, who then, of course, became a president of, of, of Chrysler uh, before the, um, uh, the um, uh, acquisition by, uh, by, by Daimler. And, and Tom's pres, um, uh, premise was that you could lower the cost of doing business with a, 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 a vehicle manufacturer or any customer if you had strong working relations. And, and the working relations ends up being a, a factor, and we can get into this in a little later, but it's around communication, it's around lowering uh, barriers or friction. It's around improving assistance and, 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 and uh, assistance programs around cost reduction, quality improvement, uh, and the like. It's about mutual benefit, mutual profitability of growing together. And most importantly, and this was the fuzziest of, of all the attributes, it's around trust, right? Because if I trust you uh, in doing business with you on any one transaction or any one business deal, one group may win uh, more than the other, but you know, over time and certainly over numerous vehicle programs, those wins and losses all net out. I mean, that, that's what, what Tom's premise was. So, so Dr. Hankey put the, the index together. Uh, it's, it's around actually in, in total three, three primary indices that we, we, we calculate on, uh, which, which incorporates about 60 to 70 questions out of this major survey. And, um, uh, and then we ask another 20 or so individual questions that are more topical. But you can see from this graph that over the years, the positions change. Um, and, and, and a lot of that, it tends to be with the leadership of the organization, but, but it's not just the leadership of the purchasing organization. The one point I wanna make is it's, it's about alignment. It's about alignment from your corporate uh, parent staffs. And so if that's a global organization based in Europe or in Japan, it's how they deal with the purchasing offices here in, in, in North America. It's also about alignment horizontally. So is engineering aligned up with manufacturing and supply chain and quality and all the other touch points with the supplier? Those all too have to be aligned to lower the cost of doing business, lower the friction, and in turn improve the price position or the possible price position uh, of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a purchase part. And so we've had uh, historically Toyota's been on top, Honda has been in second place. If you look at General Motors, though, GM was tied uh, for last place if you go back to 20, just to 2015, just six years ago. Uh, but they took a concerted effort to incorporate the, this index into their business. And it's just like anything else, you get what you measure. And so going back, uh, just a little side story, General Motors actually incorporates uh, the WRI into their uh, uh, purchasing director's annual performance reviews. Um, you know, for years, it, it was always said, look, you, you know, the, the OEMs would get up on the stage and say, we wanna be your customer of choice. We wanna be a good customer for you. But everyone knows if, if you're only, and, and this is rational, it's not a, 
a criticism. It's completely rational. If all you're doing or the majority of what you're doing is judging a buyer on their budget, on their annual reduction in the budget of the materials that they're responsible for, that's what you're going to get. You're not going to get strong relationships. You're not going to get goodwill built up. You're not going to get those other um, intrinsic aspects that can help you. And we can lead into this, Bruce, when you really have a crisis at hand. Um, and so they've taken that to, to, to um, I, I think, to heart. Uh, GM also has what they created over the years, what they call a strate their strategic supplier engagement program. Um, their SSE program for their top 400 suppliers. Um, and they integrate our survey as a third party independent input uh, for the suppliers to have a, a safe space uh, to bring their, um, uh, their, their complaints as well as their compliments uh, to, to GM. Ford has, has kind of hung out here in the middle uh, uh, ground here. And then if you look at Nissan and, and FCA, we put FCA because this was uh, the current year um, survey, which really monitored back to 2021, pre-merger with PSA and the, and the creation of Stellantis. But if you look at Nissan, Nissan's the interesting one here. Look, they were, at, at, they were third as recently as 2014. And then as they put in their, uh, uh, their, their dramatic cost reduction efforts and required from the suppliers uh, significant annual productivity reductions, um, you can see that if that's what they were judging, they were judging price, uh, uh, price downs, they got those, but every, at the peril of everything else. And they collapsed down into last place out of these six OEMs in 2018. Uh, we started working with them uh, in earnest two years ago. And you could see that, again, getting alignment. Our, our survey numbers went back to, to Japan um, in terms of leadership. Um, in, in fact, at their last uh, uh, supplier uh, uh, um, uh, council or their supplier quality awards meeting, um, uh, the, the president and CEO gave a, a video um, presentation uh, to the supply base. Uh, so it's, it's gone there to be aligned with North America. And again, they are using our data to work with engineering and, and the other functional areas to support purchasing. Because for the, the purchasing managers out there in, in, in your audience, look, th this isn't just on your shoulders, right? You, you have to have all of the functions working with, uh, uh, with you that touch suppliers. Uh, and, then, and then FCA or Stellantis is, is down on the bottom, yeah. Do you have any follow-up questions there, Bruce, or did I hit what you wanted to hit? No, uh, Dave, I think you really uh, lay out a good, a good uh, scenario of, of how the WRI is, is designed. Uh, you also look at, at, at how the different companies are, have been responding. And, and as we said in our prior discussion, uh, there over period since, since the 1990s, I mean, there was a point even in the 1990s when FCA was was the one of the top uh, companies for uh, manufacturer supplier relations. So yeah, this yeah, and and a lot of that, Bruce, I'll say, uh, did go back to uh, to the leadership of of the whole organization, um, and particularly at that point in time. You know, I will say Dan, Dan Knott, who was the vice president of purchasing at Nissan, um, you know, he came over from engineering. Uh, so he was, he was a technical person. He was very results oriented. Uh, he certainly wasn't an overly emotional guy, right? 
being a, you know, he was the chief engineer on the, uh, on the original uh, Grand, Grand Cherokee uh, that came out. And so he, he had, he had an approach to him that the suppliers all, you know, lined up behind. And, and he ran these uh, town hall meetings internal at, at, uh, uh, at, at, uh, at F, uh, it was an FCA at the time, it was at Chrysler. Um, and, and it was all about problem solving. It wasn't about we need this or you need to do this or what. It was about pointing out, you know, one, one classic example I'll always remember. It was as simple as not simple because the industry deals with this every day. Um, shortage of, of of containers and and shipping racks. And you know he put his guys together with the suppliers who were uh, expressing those uh, issues together with his ombudsman and his uh, you know call center his troubleshooters guys, um, and and challenged them to come up with a solution in a couple of weeks and report back at the next uh, town hall or the one uh, where, where the, the call center, they moved it, uh, they moved it out west, uh, I think it was to Arizona, of course, they, they didn't, they, they changed the, the uh, hours to the, to the time zones, right, and took it out of the east coast where most of the, most of the suppliers were, so there was a backlog in, in, in phone calls. You know, it's simple and, and these look simple, but you know, what he did was he, he allowed the suppliers again in a safe space to raise these issues right up to the top. And he wasn't blaming, putting blame on anybody. He was getting the job done. And those guys would have walked through, you know, anything for him. And unfortunately he died an untimely death. Um, earlier, I think, he, you know, he would have instilled even more of those, those relationships and things for, for Chrysler. I guess, let, let me, if I could jump, um, you know, this, this is one that I do want to, a couple of slides here, um, Bruce, maybe to, to hone in on, and, 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 and I'll, 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 be quiet for a little bit if you want for, for follow-up questions. But this was one when we took over the WRI and I first went into the vehicle manufacturers to resent. Uh, this would have been two years ago. So it would have been the 2019, I guess, the 2019 results. Um, and the OEMs looked and said, okay, well, we understand we have to improve trust. But what is trust, right? I mean, it's, it's a complex thing. Um, and so we need to know what to work on. And this is when I, you know, I kind of realized we were getting traction in this area because they weren't just taking the data and, you know, for itself, but they were challenging it. And they were challenging us at Plant Moran, which is good. And we, we went with a, a professor actually that worked with, Dr. Hankey on a couple of joint papers, and we asked him to research uh, this to find out what was in the academic research on commercial trust. And he came back with three elements, realistic expectations. All right, think about what I just mentioned about the you know, exorbitant uh, year over year cost downs and productivity. Uh, and what the results were to the WRI. It was about commitment and accountability, you know, in terms of saying, you know, doing what I, I'm going to uh, tell you that I'm going to do and following through. And, um, uh, you know, there I, I think, think about the story with General Motors and, you know, they want to be the customer of choice. Well, that, that's good to say it, but you know, it was, it was a difficult sell to put even a small amount or even to talk about the WRI in performance reviews, right? So that's, to me, that was a commitment. Um, and it's about information sharing. 
Um, and, and that's where, you know, everybody has competitive information and, 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 and certainly like that um, in, in terms of uh, uh, intellectual property and, 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 and the like. But, you know, you always find when you go into a meeting with information and you share that, you come out of the, of the meeting with greater information uh, that you can work with. So we've, I, we've identified questions that we're tracking this now. But the complex thing is it's established at the buyer level. If your buyers aren't doing this, if your buyers aren't trained uh, and, and reinforced at this, you know, you, you're not going to get trust. It's reinforced at the corporate level. If the buyer is saying one thing, but his, his or her boss is, is saying another thing. And, you know, the, the corporate strategy is, is completely a third thing. Uh, you're, you're not going to get, you're not going to get good relationships. And I do believe, I truly believe this all re results back in lowering the cost of doing business. Um, and we can get into it in a little bit here, Bruce, about you know, the present day state and going forward. Um, I, I do believe that these relationships give you additional degrees of freedom to address complex issues that are difficult to, you know, they, they're externalities. You can't forecast them. Uh, they, they come at you and you don't know how to deal with it. And you, 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 you need somebody to call and you need to have a partner, a strong supplier or a strong customer on the other end of that phone uh, to get, get you through it. Yeah. And I think that, I think that Leah really does, uh, does a nice job of leading into where we are today, Dave. You, you've talked about uh, how the companies are, are rated uh, from, uh, from the supplier surveys. Uh, but we're also dealing with uh, some putting out a, a ma some major fires going on right now uh, in the in the supply base. Uh, how do you see this these the, the chip shortage and the other shortages that are going on? Uh, how do you see that playing out in in the near term? Yeah, well, chips chips are going to be with the industry for uh, you know e even listening to the. Uh, uh, the chip manufacturers them, them, themselves uh, directly uh, here through 2022. Um, you know, maybe maybe they're setting up one expectation to be able to, to 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 beat that, but the supply, the supply is going to be an issue, uh, and, and particularly when you think about these long pipelines on a global stage, the ability to prime that pump. And to keep consistent flow uh, of, of any product through is, is difficult. And then on top of that, layer in all of the uh, electric vehicle launches that are going. And so the vehicle manufacturers and the suppliers are going to be focused on those to be able to secure uh, the chips and the inventory. Uh, to support those launches, that it, it's like squeezing a balloon, right? You, you know, you squeeze it in one area um, uh, to, 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 to get supply in another area. And, and that's where it, it's going to be a, a, a continual um, uh, shortages in flux uh, through, through the, the, the better part of 2022 until we can get more supply and if you think about the the large investments that Intel has in, uh, has announced both here in the United States as well as in Europe uh, those correct me here but those those timelines aren't until 2023 into 2024 when those come on stream uh, in full production right um, so so that's that's where I, I, I see the chip. Uh, shortage. Do you see the Do you see the U.S. government's uh, uh, strategy for supporting uh, and meet, meeting uh, making these uh, 
uh, the semiconductor chips uh, a national priority. Uh, how do you see that playing out? Well, it, it's, you know, when, when we look at um, from a national security standpoint, when we look at, you know, certainly uh, fulfillment of the, the, the premise of the uh, uh, U.S. Mexico Canada agreement, USMCA, in terms of sourcing higher uh, value added, higher, um, you know, um, you know, higher value added uh, components, critical components for, uh, for the electric vehicle uh, here in the United States, or at least within the region, it plays into, into that strategy. So that, you know, the, the thing with government grants are always, you know, difficult that they don't over incentivize uh, what, what could become stranded capacity. And by that, I mean, you know, the, the pendulum swing, because the, the business, the business case swings over on, on the, on the grants and things like that, that, um, you build the capacity in that may not be utilized going forward in terms of the chips. It looks like, you know, with all, all in industrial demand, all consumer demand. Uh, you look at, at, at everything else that, that these electronic chips are going into, the base need is absolutely there. The, the thing is, is how do, you, how do you build flexibility into that capacity that you're able to support, whether that's automotive demand, and automotive demand that's changing in terms of its specification, um, as, as well as telecommunications and household appliances and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and other components. But it, it's, it's a critical piece. And, and, and I think to, to secure, to deepen the supply chain here is, is important. And that's one of the, the trends that we see within the auto industry um, is globalization overall, I think, you know, all these companies will, will still play with a global footprint. You have to do that to have the scale to generate the capital that's required and particularly in the transformation from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles. Um, but you, you're going to have these regional supply chains that are, are deeper, I believe, than, than we have now. Um, and, 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 but, but the other thing, Bruce, not to lose sight of here is even though I'm talking about a deepening of regional supply chains, the one thing I think the industry always needs to look at is, is, is swing capacity. So by that, I mean, you're never going to be absolutely right in terms of, of forecasting what models are, being, uh, are going to be in demand or certainly trim levels of vehicles uh, that might be in demand. And so it's going to be important, I think, to have um, validation and, um, done at a global level that you can import and export products of, across regions to be able to balance supply and demand out. So that, that's going to keep the global trade and the need for uh, our, our shipping lanes uh, secure and, and our, our air lanes secure uh, going forward. And Dave, when we, whenever we talk about uh, manufacturer supplier relations, and it, and it, and I'm, I'm sure it, it shows up in your survey as well. Uh, so much has to do with pricing, and and when you look at the issues of globalization, where manufacturers uh, ha, uh, continue to search the globe for better pricing, as well as all the other components that are part of uh, of their of what they need, uh, 
being able to get a, a new R&D out of a company to for, for price reductions, for other things like that. The, but for to for so much of the focus tends traditionally to be on pricing. Uh, if there are global, uh, if the other countries end up deciding to go into chips and they have better pricing for those chips, would you see that as a challenge to the regionalization of, of semiconductors in, uh, in, in, the, in North America? Well, you know, the, there is always, and will probably always continue to be the, the, the joke in the industry that the, the price moves, but the product doesn't, right? <laughs> you know, that, that you hold up a, a, a China price or a low cost country price uh, to, to, to get your current supplier uh, to reduce their price or to reduce their quote on a, uh, on a, on a future quote package. Um, and so, you know, without a doubt, there's going to be an increase of, of capacity you know, it's already been announced and sure that I'm sure that will be announced over the next few years here in the Asia Pacific region. And that's, that's what, that's where I worry about overcapacity in the industry that, you know, can, can swing the pendulum the other way. I guess I come back to though, of a strategic thought of where do you source and how do you support source these, these components. Um, and I never understood why, you know, with, with purchase goods, with, with, the, with the cost of goods sold is 60% or so is, is, is the supply chain, right? It's in, in most major manufacturing uh, business, uh, uh, structures that purchasing isn't a more strategic issue um, with that amount of value being um, being at risk in your in your in your structure. So my answer then would get to this is I and I also think it's it's related back to whether it's the discussion around rare earth um, uh, minerals, uh, when we start talking about the lithium and the cobalt and the other, other materials that are in batteries that the industry is going to be consuming significant amounts of, and I understand there's a lot of technology change that's coming down the pike that, that could alter that. But, but the, the, the political and economic risks, I think, are going to be included into these purchasing decisions um, going forward so that, um, so that we don't swing back, back the, the pendulum and get, um, get uh, locked into a high risk high mileage uh, supply chain again. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, but that takes discipline and we lose sight, you know, as I went through all of that, you know, it's, it's easy to lose sight and, and chase down the, the, the lowest cost without thinking about what the true, true landed cost is. Yeah. And what your, and your, what, what your strategy is. And I think that's, the, you know, here real quick, let me just add, you know, one thing that's interesting where you started out the conversation with, with, the, with the correct chronology about the vehicle manufacturers spinning, out, or the, at least the Detroit three, spinning out their parts produ production uh, uh, capabilities, right, into uh, Delphi, um, Visteon, and the Automotive Components Group. Um, there, but look at what's happening now with electrification, right? And, and 
the value that's coming back into these businesses when we talk about battery production, even though it, and it may be a joint venture uh, structure, but still there's, there's an ownership piece to it there. Um, and, and looking at bad, or I'm sorry, motor and inverter uh, manufacturing that may be done in-house so that these vehicle manufacturers can control uh, the capacities and, and the ca capabilities that they will need to support their, their, their very ambitious electrification uh, uh, strategies. Yeah, I agree. Uh, that's going to be one of the real challenges for the manufacturers about whether they can actually uh, change their companies to become kind of like instead of mechanical engineers, well, there's always going to be some mechanical engineers, but will they need more chemical engineers? Will you actually design your own cells? And, you know, this is going to be a, a huge challenge for the industry because it's such a huge transition from where they are today. And, yeah. and, there, and because there are so many capable suppliers out there that are also in the middle of doing, uh, doing their own R&D on this. It's not yeah. like they're standing still. No, and, and the, model, the model historically has been that you, the vehicle manufacturer will outsource uh, you know, a, a new product or a, 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 yeah, a, a, any new product that where the volumes are uh, low, where there's not uh, uh, economies of, to scale, um, and and then when when those volumes do emerge, then they pull that back in and vertically integrate. Mm -hmm. uh, here here the industry is kind of stepping out. A, I won't say ahead of itself, but certainly in parallel to itself mm -hmm. uh, to 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 build this internal uh, capabilities. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be a fascinating story going forward. It always is. <laughs> Dave, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time today. We, we really appreciate you uh, giving us your insight and then about the WRI and also about the uh, where you see things happening, going, heading in the future. Uh, it always fits in with our automotive futures theme, right? Uh, so uh, uh, thanks again and uh, take care and we'll, uh, we'll talk later. Very good, Bruce. And thanks for everything you do putting... Uh putting this series together and uh, for, uh, uh, for the consortium that you built for the auto automotive futures. All right. Thanks, Dave. Take care. All right. You too. Bye now. Bye-bye.